Okay, good evening all. I'd like to uh, welcome you uh, tonight and I'll hand over to our president to uh, make that official. Thank, thanks, Don. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Bendigo Amateur Radio and Electronics Club headquarters um, at Bendigo East, for those of you who are here. And uh, welcome also to all of our friends on Zoom this evening. Uh, glad you could all make it. Um, this evening, we have uh, some rather interesting announcements and, and introductions to our SIGS initiative. Uh, SIGS is a special interest group session. Uh, as the name suggests, these are meetings of small groups of our members and friends uh, to discuss and share their knowledge on any particular area of the art of amateur radio. Um, so this sort of coincides with the, um, it's a kind of an opening of our training rooms, but we'll, we'll, it's baby steps at first, but we'll, we'll get there eventually and the thing will come up to speed in due course. Um, we also received an apology from Graham GRK this evening. Graham was going to be making a SIGS presentation, uh, but his mum Judy is in hospital this evening and we wish her well and a speedy recovery. Uh, a couple of announcements. Uh, the polo shirts have been ordered and are due any day now. So watch this space and uh, come and get your shirt. Um, we're also now taking expressions of interest. This is the training team is taking expressions of interest for amateur radio licence training. Now, there are no details at the present. Uh, the start date and uh, format will depend on the numbers and on COVID restrictions at the time. The progress on the antenna project has picked up. We've signed the funding agreement with the City of Greater Bendigo. Approval has been given for the final engineering adjustments, which needed to be made. The first round of purchases has been made for the bill of materials. Uh, volunteers will be asked for over the coming Wednesdays to help pre-assemble parts of the project before work commences. And the hall is likely to be closed on at least one Wednesday uh, while the work is in progress. Uh, the sausage sizzle is coming up on Saturday the 9th of October. We'll be requesting volunteers for that. Uh, so you're down at Kangaroo Flat there, uh, the usual location. Uh, so keep an eye out uh, for the emails on that. Uh, we'll be looking for people who are double vaccinated, of course, uh, to be uh, operating out in public. Okay, well, I think that's it. Uh, but we do have a bit of a surprise presentation before we uh, commence this evening. Um, could I ask Mike and Heidi to please come forward? Yeah, yeah we know you're innocent. Come on. <laughs> okay. Right. Would you like to look after that? Right. One for you. And one for all. Now, the background to this, of course, is that the City of Greater Bendigo did not want to give us a flagpole. So we decided that we would, we would thwart them. Oh, it needs to be a bit taller. That's all right. It'll do. <laughs> Don't do that. It's horrible. It's horrible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you for getting that right. Mike, would you like to do the honours to unfurl this flag, please? And then I'll tell you a little bit of story behind it. Wow, great. That is absolutely fantastic. Well, you better turn it around so everybody else can see it. I had the idea of um, that we needed to do something that was special for our club in terms of identification. Spoke to Neil about it, and Neil and I have contributed that to the club. Yeah. 
can't find some bulldogs to put up and take the football. You could, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I think I think we should do the national flag a bit, bit, bit of justice to what we've got there. Just to... yeah. Yeah. Okay. And thanks to Julie for um, making dust covers. Yeah. Um, um, all right. Well, it's that... actually a bit, it's missing off it. The... I thought there was. I thought there was something. Something different about it. Right. There you go. Okay. Um, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Heidi, for doing that. Um, I couldn't think of uh, two more deserving people to do the unfurling of our flags, especially the club flag. And um, unfortunately, with Graham not being here, um, he made a comment uh, the other day that, "Oh, great! Now we'll be able to march in the uh, Easter parade." I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. Um, so, Sigs. The membership of Varick has grown exponentially over the last two years by an amazing 20% each year to a strong position of 70 members and more to come, and uh, two of our most recent uh, members are now financial members, so I am confident that, Neil, we can now say that we have reached 70. There are many reasons it can be attributed to, but not limited to, the relocation from Longley, and there's another story on that which I won't go into, bringing us here to East Bendigo. Active members who have an, um, a wide interest in amateur radio and electronics. A committee that is working to the club's strategic plan. And I think that's been a critical contribution. Great communication to our members through an informative and relevant media operation. Example of that here tonight with Cole and Craig and the work that um, Graham does uh, to keep us informed about what's happening. The weekly Wednesday morning meetings continue to grow and provide the opportunity to catch up for a chat over what members are doing with them at the radio or just even having a, a cuppa. So what is SIGS and how do we see it operating? Neil, what I might get you to do, would you hand out one of these flow charts to everyone here and make sure that um, Craig gets a colour copy? Thanks. Following a brief informal conversation at one of these Wednesday meetings, feedback from the recently is issued interest survey and what we, Barrack, can do to make the most of the use of our new headquarters, especially on Saturdays and Sundays, when more members may have time available, the idea of SIGS was raised. SIGS being special interest group sessions. Using the expertise of Barrack members to deliver learning on facets of amateur radio to members who wish to broaden their exposure on areas of amateur radio. Now let me, let me use myself as an example. I want to relearn and become active on CW. Now, a lot of people look at me and say, Don, you're crazy. But I, I genuinely have an interest in it, that, that I want to get back and uh, not only learn it, but become active in uh, being able to communicate using CW. So how can I use the club to achieve this? Investigating and discussing CW with members, it became evident that we have a member who is active on this band and following conversation with Tony, VK3CTM, thank you Tony, he was positive and receptive in seeing what can be offered in this area to set up a program of sessions on learning and running a session uh, using Morse code. Or it may be Tony 
who was interested in running a session on introduction to amateur radio. And Tony KKP is going to do that via Zoom this evening. Expression of interest from a member on a specific subject will be submitted through to me. And if you follow the, uh, the flow chart, consultation and communication on who can deliver the session. So we find someone in the club who's got the expertise and is willing not only to run it, but also to own it and lead it. The success of it will be built around the number of people who are prepared to put the time into it. Setting up a schedule, this will obviously be subject to the current COVID-19 restrictions. However, the use of Zoom meetings will also prove to be a suitable method. Appointing the SIG owner for the specific activity, as I say, it's critical that the workload is spread across members and not left to a few. So what do I see as the benefits of holding SIGs will deliver? Greater activity and involvement across the amateur radio spectrum by members. Greater use of this magnificent headquarters across times that are currently not utilised or that we wish to retain for club activities. As the hall convener or coordinator, one of the biggest problems I have is saying no to people who ring up and say, I'd like to make a booking for the hall. Can I book the hall? Yes, when would you like it? Oh, I'd like it on Friday or Saturday night. No, sorry, not available. If we can then turn around and show that we're using it to a greater degree, that becomes very easy in terms of saying no. I do take the time to discuss with the people making inquiries that, and give them other areas, another avenues that they can have a look around Bendigo because there are lots and lots of halls available. Um, and also, and not least, continued growth in our club membership and exposure to the public through our media contacts of what we're doing, um, not only here but in the broader training, the, uh, the school's involvement, scouts, guides and anyone else who is interested. I was on a, um, a net the other, the other night and um, it was um, a quote by four I no, sorry, it wasn't a net, it was a contact that I had with an with a operator in the Philippines, uh, 4I1EBD, Ian Bayou. And he has a quote on his site which says, it is not the class of the licence that the amateur holds, it's the class of the amateur that holds the licence. That's the success of amateur radio. So on that, if you've got any questions on the flow chart, but also over here, when you get time, come and have a look at what, what, started, out, what started out as a one-page, one A4 page of subjects grew to what you see up there now, and that's the response, I think, from 13 or 14 of our members, indicating what is their interest. Craig's taken it a little bit further, and uh, um, by applying some formulas, it gives uh, a colour printout to me as to whether the interest is greater than or less than in, in an average. And uh, I started putting it together or putting it out there to give it to the committee to say, well, what, where does the club want to be as part of our strategic plan in five years' time? How do we plan for that? That helps. Yes, Mike. You uh, see that uh, out of the work of Special Interest Group 2, we would eventually end up producing some papers that could be uh, publicised by other media, but other groups to benefit from that, do you think? Absolutely. Yeah, I think um, by involving the, our media people and, uh, and, and our leaders um, um, who uh, and owners of that SIG session, yes, I can see that that would um, be definitely um, advantageous, not only to ourselves and our members, but also to other people who may show an interest. Yep. For instance, if we were to do a session on uh, emergency power, uh, it would be very uh, helpful for other groups who were looking at the same situation. I know somebody else had a session on it and it impressed a lot of the, the, the 
Absolutely. And I think even out of that, um, on the discussion yesterday with um, Andrew Plant and Brad Stewart, um, it came out, uh, you know, that City Council have, have, have got plans in terms of, they now understand that in an emergency, be it bushfire, floods, uh, violent storms such as um, uh, East Victoria sustained earlier this year, um, if you haven't got your internet, you haven't got your phone towers, you're screwed, you've got no communication. But yes, we have. We have thousands of amateur radio operators around this country who can provide that emergency service. And council have actually suddenly, well, maybe not suddenly, but it has become of interest. Yeah, yeah. They realise the vulnerability. They've made the connection that if you lose power, you lose communication. Yeah. Which, which is what they realise. Um, so if they seem to lack expertise in knowing what to do about it. Agreed. That was the impression that I got. Yeah. And, um, and uh, Andrew, who was, who was strong community, was often to be very candid when I said we've been thinking about um, the, the strategies that we could implement for emergency communication. And of course, I think his eyes got lit up a bit. They did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And another thing that came out of yesterday's meeting was that um, the contact that we had from someone whether we would be interested in solar power, well, that person's now working with City Council to put solar power on its many, if not all, of City Council buildings, uh, including this one where they can actually bank some of that power and use it at other sites where they don't have sufficient uh, generation to operate, such as the um, kangaroo flat swimming, swimming complex. Um, so they would save power from, say, here, because they'd have a hell of a lot more um, panels, and some of that power can then be redirected elsewhere in the council area, and ultimately, who benefits from that, the community, because that's got to have an impact on a re, you know on where rates go down. So amateur radio, despite what a lot of people say, is a dying experience. Because I won't use that other word. Art, an art, um, clearly indicates that. Where would you find a club that's grown 20% over the last two years? And where would you find a club that's an active operational club that has 70 financial members? I don't know. In Australia, I don't know. But I can say one thing, I'm proud to be part of this club. Thank you. Okay, so I'd now like to um, hand over to Craig. Um, the next session will be an introduction to amateur radio from uh, Tony Fellow, VK3 KKP. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about why I think the idea of Barrick supporting special interest groups is going to actually help me in my interests in the promotion of amateur radio. I'm now uh, concentrating more on that than any of the other things I've been doing. Um, it's been quite successful recently, and so I'm enjoying it. And then I will describe the uh, several SIGs that I have hoped to uh, be coordinating in the hope that some of you will join in. Now, the internet turned up when I was working at a university, and I suddenly realised that the odd academic who was working on some obscure and lonely research, unsupported by local colleagues, suddenly had contact with like-minded researchers in other universities, and then I realized that's a special interest group was born. And we've got the same situation now, really. We, we can uh, all connect with each other from all over the world. More recently, an event called Jota, Jamboree on the Air, brought together a group of scouts who were trained by members of Barrick. That's the Bendigo Amateur Radio and Electronics Club for outside uh, watchers to become radio amateurs. And that was what I considered another special interest group. Uh, that, by the way, that story on the ABC is still on their website. 
as a number two if you put in amateur radio. So I think that's pretty good. That that's a story went round the world at the time. So you know these sort of things do uh, actually make a difference. And uh, at the last coffee morning that we held on Zoom, uh, we all got talking, and obviously you were talking on the Wednesday coffee morning as well. And we we're talking about splitting our current specialist groups into groups of similar abilities who could ask questions of more experienced presenters, rather than sitting having to sit through the occasional more complex and advanced presentations. I mean, it's hard to ha have a beginner's session in the middle of, um, say, the uh, digital modes group because everybody else gets bored. You know, you need to as, organize it as ability levels, really. COVID has taught Barrett much about education and communication generally. Our membership has increased dramatically, as Don has said, but we do need to keep the uh, new members interested and um, we need to give them the support and, and share our knowledge. And uh, Zoom has helped that. Uh, we've got mem members, we've got non-members who we call Friends of Barrack and other clubs members joining us for presentations on Zoom and not just from Victoria. Now, nearly everyone, I've said this before, but nearly everyone has had a mentor to encourage us into the activity of electronics and amateur radio. And I got my first radio license, amateur radio license in 1973, but it took me several years to build a transmitter and a receiver and, the, and with the help of another local radio amateur to actually get to use it. And it's always been slow progress through the nearly 50 years since then. It hasn't uh, been all smooth sailing. But imagine being able to ask a question whenever you're stuck with a technical problem. I know there's YouTube, but that can be a slog and not much help, even misleading. We need to be in a position to demonstrate exactly what the newcomer needs to know. I'd like to suggest a few ideas for this scheme, uh, this, this, and they are just ideas. Um, we need to have a discussion about it. As we will, and also we'll be hearing from others in this presentation who have got their own ideas. But we need people to coordinate each group. And we already have many members effectively doing just that. But they will be even more effective using the extensive organizing facilities of Barrack. And, and by, by that, I mean the mail outs, the Zoom groups, and, and all, all those sort of things that uh, can be pressed into service to um, communicate with our members and uh, the friends of Barrick. And I always think that uh, you, you shouldn't press people to join a club. You should let them try before they buy. And uh, I think that's worked out well because we've, um, Graham has been mailing out to uh, people we've discovered just chatting to or even looking through the ECMA list for people who live in rural areas in our scope and um, asking them if they'd like to be on that thing. Some have joined our club, and uh, I don't think we've lost anybody by that method. I don't believe there is a need for formal membership to these groups. If, if the mail outs go to everyone and uh, Facebook posts, one, one can choose to go to any uh, SIG that you want to. And I think there should be also flexibility in hosting so it's not always the same mentor, and it needn't be, um, as long as there is somebody sort of generally responsible for communicating that when they're, when they're on. Uh, I think that every time um, a SIG offers something, it should have what it's offering on the mail out, so that uh, all the club members, the non-members, and the other clubs get to know that this SIG a special interest group is about a particular subject in quite detail. And I, I think it should be open to anyone. Well, I've, I've already said that. Um, all those who can get to the club rooms. We may have a system where uh, one, the presenters and some of the members are on Zoom. We could have everybody on Zoom if it was difficult with the club access at the time. There's no absolute re re need to use the club every time. And uh, 
of course, we have presenters from all over the place. We've had that guy from Adelaide give us a talk. And uh, that was very successful. And I think that uh, the SIGs can be whenever they're needed. If there's not, not much interest, there's not much point having one every month if nobody's going to turn up. So I think, you, you know, you have to have a, um, a reasonable understanding of what the demand is going to be um, for, to, to, to advertise and to bring people to a special meeting of SIG, special interest groups. I hope this club meeting today will consolidate the plan or at least take some of the ideas away and come up uh, with a, a structured response to it. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, that's something that uh, it's the club committee can do. Uh, at the university I was talking about before, we had orientation week, a week where all the clubs of the student union met in the square and offered their interests to the new students. Things like the beer drinking club always managed to attract a cloud, crowd, but I never did see an amateur radio club at one of these things. Although I was involved in uh, University of Nottingham radio club and uh, myself and that chat from Adelaide, Chris, um, we kept it going through the summer holidays because, uh, you know, the, um, the amateurs went away home for six weeks, 12 weeks. And so we kept it going. And I think that club is still going. Uh, so we're pleased about that. Well, in, in the next hour or so, you will see three or four presentations. I, I think Graham's not here, so probably be less than that because Graham's got some great presentations in mind to do with digital modes, a J, JS8 core, that sort of thing. But uh, we're going to be spruiking our clubs um, offerings. I'm going to be talking about mine. Tony's going to be talking about his, which I know is going to be to do with the CW. And uh, if we get more members subsequently who are interested in becoming uh, pres not presenters, but coordinators, as it were, then um, but one important thing I think is um, essential that the uh, SIGs are done as a sort of question and answer arrangement so that you're always listening to what the people who are members of it want to hear, rather than static presentations about what you think they want to hear. So I think that's a different thing to our presentations that we have on, um, on club nights. Now, some of my ideas um, for six that uh, I, I won't be particularly interested in coordinating, but I do know there are people interested in the club who, if they were, if they said they were interested in coordinating, could be very valuable members. And some of these things are already happening. So, you know, I'm not trying to imply that nothing's happening. But, uh, for instance, image transmission, slow scan TV and digital amateur television, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there are several members of this club already doing that including F. Call, uh, Tony Langdon, of course, is interested. I'm interested, and um, that would be an, uh, a good one. Keyboard modes, JS8 Call and FT8. Well, Graham is obviously the one for that one. I, I'd step away from the uh, digital modes net that we do on Sundays uh, and 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 wind it into the SIGS idea. Uh, there's high altitude balloon and space communications, and that includes satellites, uh, FM satellites. Uh, I, I do know of uh, some new F calls who are interested in that and uh, be listening to the ISS over the weekend for a start. Now, the one I want to um, offer, and I'm already doing this with people, is getting started in amateur radio, brackets and staying. Because, uh, you know, in America, I think it's 50% of all the uh, beginners don't even transmit ever um, they, they, because they lose interest. They've not lost support. Once the uh, exam's over, I think that's the most important time. 
Uh, hotspots for networking is another one. And of course, I've mentioned CW training and operation. There's, a, there's an assessment group that's needed, which already exists, but it could be called passing the amateur radio exam, um, SIG. Now, another one I'm interested in, community radio watch during natural disasters. Now that's something I've been doing in Castle, Maine, at the request of people such as Ben, who's in the crowd there, um, and another guy that's in Harcourt who uh, passed his foundation uh, assessment uh, on my um, suggestion so that we could form a group like that. And we have, uh, we're, we're starting to get organized. Uh, I won't go through it, what we're doing, but um, it's, we've had talks with the council here in Mount Alexander Shire. And it sounds like you guys up in Bendigo are talking to your uh, Shire council or local government and whatever. Now there could even be a group for social connections who organize the coffee mornings, the nets, the Zoom meetings, and YouTube. Um, Craig's in that. Yeah, the, the people who set up tonight are in that special interest group because they, they're concerned with gathering interested radio amateurs together to listen to presentations or just having chats. I mean, the coffee morning that we had the other day that was in, usually in Castle Maine somewhere in a park was on Zoom because of lockdowns. And we didn't, I've never covered so much area about organization and things than, um, than I have on that day. So they shouldn't all be presentations. You know, we can get together for Zoom things so we can include people who can't get to the club. Um, and that means our um, coverage is increased because we can include people who are, are remote or um, unable to come for any other reason. Uh, obviously, portable and mobile operating, SOTA, Mills on the Air, contests and other events could be another group. Uh, this one's an interesting one. Repair, maintenance and cataloging of loan equipment. I've loaned some of my own equipment and uh, the second person who's had it um, just made their first HF contact uh, last weekend uh, after being very frustrated for a long time at not being able to make any contacts with it. But because I've been able to um, you know, basically help in that regard uh, uh, and gradually uh, skill up this person. Um, he's finally succeeded. And uh, I can tell you that his parents think it's marvelous that he's uh, had a real boost uh, as a result of that contact. And then, um, so the loan equipment needs to be looked after. Uh, I've got equipment here that's been given to me for this purpose, but that needs checking out. I need somebody else who's skilled. And uh, we also need to keep a record of who we've learned things to and recover them so that we can lend them to somebody else. And uh, the, next, the last uh, idea is anything anyone asks for, because as soon as you get a suggestion from people, that's when you can start creating um, a solution to it. So as I said, I, I, my intention is to become the, a coordinator in two of those things, um, and also a participant in some of the others. And, and as an ad hoc member. And uh, as I've implied, um, I'm helping out several newcomers to the activity of radio, and I have done in the past. And uh, I'm also prepared to encourage people who sh showed an interest to become licensed to study. So it'll be the first part of this thing will be to explain to people what amateur radio is and why they should be a member. And that'll be through Jota. It'll be through my contacts at the local high school here. Uh, I think with the success we've had with the students we've had, um, it, it's easy to say, have a look at this. This is two 10 year olds past the exam. Surely you could uh, find it, um, the skill necessary to pass it too. And uh, they've got friends at school and their friends are interested. So I think, uh, uh, building on the success of the scout movement as, as members is one thing, and um, that's what I'd like to do. Uh, I've, I've done a little practice thing on our Facebook group tonight. Um, I've, uh, I made a little uh, tu tutorial about how to use web SDRs for digital 
modes reception and um, for free, apart from owning the computer, which most of them will do because they can't see face, Facebook otherwise, um, free software, uh, no extra hardware. And I've actually got a page up there with a the picture up that shows 20 meter activity this afternoon on FD8 without no other uh, amateurs on, on the band um, noticeable. And um, so, you know, then once I've got them interested in amateur radio, I pass them over to the qualified training people in the club. And that's the other SIG to do with assessment. And when they become licensed, I would help them. And I know, I know people are doing this already, going around to people's shacks, helping them put up antennas, showing them how to work the radios and how to get on air. And so we'd all be part of that group. Uh, some of our trainees have barely spoken on the radio and may lose interest if we don't support them more. That's, uh, and uh, also we, I would encourage them to use the club equipment and uh, accompany them in making first uh, contacts with people. The, uh, I mentioned that uh, I think it might be two or one member has um, become interested in the group concerned with community communication and listening to a radio watch. Um, and uh, we've got a, a group of people, um, about, uh, I think it's about eight people, who uh, some of whom are badgering me to get going <laughs> because um, I, I've had a bit of a break from it all. And uh, having the Barrick Zoom channel is absolutely vital in all this. And so we've got to be grateful that Barrick has uh, funded that. So that's um, my presentation. So I'm willing to listen to uh, any of your own um, questions if I can manage to work the equipment. Thank you. So anyone got any questions? I think I just wanted to make a comment. Um, if, if I could, Tony, would, would or so it's sort of a question. Um, my, my feeling about uh, the SIGS project is that um, people might get shy of it if they, they feel like they're taking on a lot of responsibility. Uh, I just wanted to make the comment that if you're doing something that you really enjoy and you're passionate about, it's not the burden that you might fear it would be. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to say was that um, would you agree that this is a, an approach that will increase the diversity of activity uh, in, uh, in amateur radio and, and encourage participation. Would you, would you concur with that? Absolutely. Uh, your first uh, comment uh, about um, being interested in it is that, well, I would say that the, the um, spreadsheet that you've collected does actually indicate the structure of these things, as it were, because, you know, everybody who's very interested in one particular thing they'll know and be able to contact all the others who are interested. And there's an impromptu SIG there. there. Uh, and I'm trying to sort of get across the idea that these SIGs will be just not boring and regular, but they will be a, a, a mechanism for getting these people together, um, you know, without having to do a lot of chasing around. It'll be advertised, they'll join, um, I, I, I find that I really enjoy what I'm doing, but I, I would love to have a Zoom meeting where I could capture all these people in one lot and not have to repeat everything, that's for sure. Um, but, but, you know, there would be a dynamic going on in there. When I look at um, the survey that we sent out to members, um, I started out with um, 2 metres, 70, uh, 70 centimetre, um, 80 metre, 40 metre, 20 metre and so on. And then it, and it grew to where, you know, I'm not going to go through each of them. Um, and the feedback that came, <coughs> excuse me, that came back from members, where members had either given me additional uh, interests that they had or they 
worked out that they had access to the spreadsheet. They'd stick another column in. Um, Cole was fantastic with what he came back. He, he just gave me that many um, interests that I didn't even know existed. Um, and, and down the end here, um, there's, there's, there's stuff that I still have no idea what it is. Um, but when you look at, we'll pick out one and say, um, uh, let's say, get a larger, 3.83, special events. 3.83 was the average of 13 who were interested in special events. You know, some of, some of the averages that came back when I, when I said before that it started out, I get rid of this mask, it started out as being something that I saw as being a tool to help build what the club is delivering or planning to, live, to deliver, where are we going to be in five years' time? It's grown to what is now SIGS, where someone can say, well, oh, I've got an interest in, um, let's say, uh, packet radio. I loved packet radio when I was an operator out of uh, the Wagga Group um, 25 years ago, and I'm still interested in getting back into packet. The response from the 13 members who indicated that they were interested in packet, there's almost their... Um, an opportunity to kick a SIGS into operation uh, to look at packet. But then you talk more about it and you suddenly Graham comes along and says, oh, what about Winlink? The development of what has happened over those 25 years where now Winlink is doing more than what packet was doing. So, oh, there's something else that I would probably be more interested in learning more about Winlink. So, unfortunately, Graham can't be here tonight to talk about Winlink. Anyway, enough from me. Any other questions? I think technology has uh, stood stagnant for a few decades, and now we're suddenly finding that it's uh, it's leaping ahead. And whether it be what we're doing in amateur radio, whether it be what somebody else is doing, the best yachts that they sail on out in the lakes or road racing cars or whatever, the whole of technology has gone kaboom and expanded. And it's great that we're addressing it and saying, hey, we can be part of it too. Yeah. Tony also mentioned uh, in his presentation about the, the maintenance and loaning of gear. And uh, I, it would be remiss of me if I, if I didn't highlight in particular um, Two people who have influenced me greatly, being Mike and Neil, who are only too happy to uh, assist um, members uh, learn what they're doing or learn a bit more about what they're doing, but also fixing up stuff-ups that they've caused along the way. And um, so to both Neil and Mike, I would say thank you for that. Um, and that's also led me to unbox a, a Yaesu FRG7700, I think it was. It's been sitting in my garage for 25 years and uh, it's now in the, um, at the QDH of uh, Vic Adamswaite out at uh, Kangaroo Flat. And uh, he was on a couple of uh, nets the other night and uh, he and I were texting as he was listening, uh, so he, he's a forerunner for getting a licence. But just the fact that I can do something to encourage someone else who has a, a, an interest in amateur radio, even though at this stage he's only a shortwave listener, um, but one of the station or one of the texts came through to me and said, oh my God, he, this guy nearly blew me windows out. And of course it was a, a close by operator VK3VIN. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I'd now like to um, hand the microphone over to Tony VK3CTM. Oh, you do too? How 
dumb of me to forget that. So Tony, over to you um, to talk about uh, getting into CW. Yep. <clears throat> I think I might have notes here a little bit in excess of perhaps about a quarter of an hour talk, so I'll try to whip through it fairly quickly. I um, thought I might have had more time. Oh, fair enough. No, I think I can get through it in about probably yeah, 20 minutes or probably even less, depending on the sort of level of interest that I perceive anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, good evening. My name is Tony. My call sign is VK3 Charlie Tango Mike. My present, I'm sorry to have to read from the notes, but I think it'll, I can follow it more accurately. My presentation this evening is about learning CW. There are three codes, but I will confine my presentation to international Morse code. The other, two's, uh, the other two are Gurkha code, which is a German system, um, more suited to their language. Um, I'll get on to why Morse was pretty smart, actually. And the other one is railway code, which was, of course, vital to the running of railways, where you've got perhaps trains sharing the one track. And in fact, railways were very, very early in the piece. They realised the importance of very you know, strong and secure uh, communications. Now, I want to break this presentation down into two sections. Firstly, I want to show why CW is worth learning. And secondly, how you can learn it with a minimum amount of pain. Now, I'll start out into why CW, not young Catholic workers, but why CW. I have a short quote regarding CW from the ICOM America webpage. We call it a digital mode as it consists of an essentially binary code of ons and off tones. Dits or dots are one unit, while dars or dashes are three units in duration. Space between letters, spaces between letters are three units and the space between words are seven units. And then there's something at at first, I didn't get the, the significance of this. The writer has attached to it. If I can get my page over. Um, and he says that if only that last one, that is about the spacing between words, followed more closely on air, CW would be a bit easier, easier for, beginners, for beginners to decipher. So don't feel as though you're retreating to the dark ages of amateur radio by learning CW. You do understand it, don't you? Advantages, um, this is of gear. It is cheaper and simpler um, to manufacture a CW only transmitter. You don't need modulators, speech compressors, speech amplifiers, or other complicated blocks. Just the electronics to generate and amplify a continuous wave. Fewer blocks in the equipment means fewer parts, resulting in better reliability. Though it's not reliability, is now in electronic gear, solid state stuff is now very, very high. For the same transmitter output, a code transmitter will consume less power since the bulk of the current is drawn only when the key is down. This is ideal when using battery powered equipment in emergencies. And I think you'd all agree if you've lugged stuff into the field or up onto a peak, uh, you know, working away from a car, that the heaviest single component is usually that battery. So keeping power down means that you have more transmit time. And um, in the case of some gear, um, very, very little uh, in the way of a battery. Very low weight. You can get away with a very low weight battery indeed. Um, universal language of the Q code. Morse code is the universal language. The Q code allows people with almost no knowledge of the other's language to have quite a conversation. In fact, the Q code and abbreviations mean that the person might be in Kyrgyzstan or China or someplace like that. You, you might not know a single word of his language, yet with these little building blocks, you can build up quite a conversation. Um, we are also keeping a useful skill alive. In fact, it turns out that some countries, when I began to inquire into this, um, I think China, Russia, and a few others, I think, can't remember which the others are, teach their 
um, not just their military, but some of their students um, teach the sport of um, CW and they have competitions in speed sending and reading it, you know, where they start at like, say, 40 words a minute and then they go up from there. And uh, believe me, it's just a sort of a blinding blur and I could only snatch a word or two out of it. That's all. Um, lightweight gear, I've already mentioned that, and simple transmitters, and particularly a lightweight battery. Less chance of causing RFI due to lower power. That's something to, to be considered. Um, quietness when sending CW. In a small apartment or sh shared house, you may need to keep noise down. If you're working CW and wearing headphones, there will be very little noise leakage. Um, you can imagine, say, in a shared house or something like that. Being in arrow band mode, many signals can be packed into a small bandwidth. Additionally, CW filters can be very sharp. Um, probably if a sideband signal were that wide, CW would be perhaps that wide. Could be said to be the original digital mode. It's definitely a digital mode, no doubt about that. That's um, set. Evidence of the e efficacy of, you know, that new word that seems to be used there, rather than efficiency. Evidence of the efficacy of CW. Seeing the logs of some of the big D expeditions, um, conditions could, where conditions could not support SSB, but you'll see that they continued on and often during these last few years of pretty poor communications on the HF bands, not good conditions at all, you'd see, I mean, there haven't been any the expeditions for a while now, you know, mentioned in the, um, our magazine, Amateur Radio, but you'd often see, if you got, got hold of the big logs and they'd have thousands of uh, contacts in them, you'd see how the band sort of slowly closed down 10 metres, but you'd see that C, the, a really good CW operator someone who could operate for hour upon hour, and um, I can think of one local here who can, it's not me, um, he can go for hours, I've heard him. And um, he's very, 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 very accurate sending. I've worked him a few times. A lot of VK5s too are in that class. Um, one of them we had give us a talk, Steve, can't remember his name, SFA, VK5 SFA. He's a very uh, um, regular performer on the bands. Um, it's gener it is generally, con oh, CW won't go any further than SSB, but it carries one single tone of information. It will therefore be copyable at lower power levels. It is generally considered that 10 watts of CW is equivalent to 100, to 100 watts of SSB into the same antenna and under, and under similar conditions. When I was learning CW years back, I reduced my power to five watts from 25 watts on a little 10 meter uh, band SSB and CW transceiver. Propagation was very good. I worked much DX <coughs> and there was a real sense of achievement. <coughs> Google QRPP, that's, you know, QRP is low power, then another smaller P which indicates that it's lower power still. And you'll read of people who are using powers of just milliwatts um, to commute, or to uh, contact people the far ends of the earth. It's a bit of a thing with some people that they, they try to um, go down to the minimum amount of power. And in fact, there are some awards which, awards which are, um, you can get, they're called, I think it's kilometres per milliwatt, where they do a calculation and you can get an award. I haven't got mine yet, but, um, I'm working on it. <clears throat> now, the methods of learning CW. I'll break this area down into sections. A, receiving, and B, sending. A, receiving, that is learning to copy CW. And there are two main methods. There's the Farnsworth, and there's the Koch method, K-O-C-H. Koch was a German um, psych uh, psychologist and his method is pretty good, I reckon, but uh, the Farnsworth is the one that you hear of more often. And it's where you send the individual characters and letters at, say, 30 words per minute, right from day one, lesson one, but you um, increase the spacing between them greatly to drop the word per minute rate 
to a far lower figure, slowly you close the gaps. And you can imagine as dilidit, which is H, four dots, or dit, 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 like dilidit, da da da, or VK3 CTM. It did it up, da da da, did it da da, da da da, da da da. And it's much easier then to start packing it up into uh, a better speed. But your overall, you, you see what I mean? The, the actual transmission time's pretty short. You're spacing it out. So you're still getting back, you're sending the individual characters 30 words per minute, but that's, you know, 10 words per minute to say that's the time at which it was sent. And you've probably heard of that standard word, Paris, which is used as a test of, it's just, I'm not quite sure, P-A-R-I-S, that's um, used for determining speeds. It must be just the right length. And then the other method is the uh, Koch method, uh, there's a lot of people who do like that, and I think it's the more modern method, um, you know, more modern and, and better thought out, but I still prefer the uh, Farnsworth method. I think it's the better one. <coughs> you start learning at the desired speed, but you start with only two characters. Koch was a, a psychologist and saw the problem of a person questioning what he or she had received and suffering a mental pile-up. And that's when you say lag, you hear it diddly da, da da da, and then you suddenly think you've missed something or other, and you, um, you lose concentration or you start thinking back to what's, and you start missing the words that are still coming you know, to you. And um, I can remember years back in it, I think it was a 10 words per minute um, CW exam that I was setting to do with my full call, and the message started out um, a piece of wood thought. And immediately I thought, hang on, bits of wood don't think. Um, but then it continued on, a piece of wood thought, and I've never forgotten this, to come from the wreck of a Dutch ship or something on the coast of Western Australia is now, and then the exam ended and I sort of looked at other people. Some of them were looking as though they'd been hit and others knew that they had uh, stuck with it and passed. I believe that the Farnsworth method is better. Um, I won't do the word Paris example, because it's, you know, at times you'll begin to recognise whole words such as Q codes, 73, 88, and um, a whole host of other words. And I do really believe that that sending the words even at, or the individual letters to about 30 words a minute is the best way of learning. Then slowly you'll begin to hear words like the, um, da, did it, did it, and you you won't even think about them, they're just sort of in your head. Words like, or word groupings, like trigrams and bigrams, like TH and R, the way certain letters are grouped. You get caught out, you think, ah, oh, he's gonna send through, and in fact he starts to send throw for some reason, and you, get, you, get, you can get caught out there. So you've just gotta sort of sit with it, but that comes later. Um, well, some of the things, the tools that you can use, or secondly, I'm starting to lose my points sequence here a bit, you can get, there's a whole lot of CW learning software. Many programs are available. Just Learn Morse is the title of one. Um, that's really excellent stuff. There's a Norwegian ham who has the very strange name, Sigurd Stenazen, I think it is. Uh, his call sign is LB3KB, and his software is very useful. You can set all sorts of parameters. You can paste in a bit of stuff and you can just sort of sit there and then if you lose track, then you just look down. Ah, yep, I think I'm back on track now. Look away. You can set the speed. You can set the pitch, um, the whole thing. You can send him a bit of cash if you want to. I've, over the years, I've, you know, sent him every now 10 bucks or 15 bucks and I've got acknowledgement for that. Um, thirdly, the setting up CW skeds. Um, with other people of about the same level. Um, then fourthly, there's listening to a whole lot of the broadcasts. The VK2WI broadcasts are very good ones because they vary the speed. Um, you'll hear them drop out about eight or nine in the morning. They come in in the evening and you pick it up. So you get used to copying very, very faint signals. But they go up, I think, to about, well, they might even scamper along on occasion, I think at about 40 words per minute but they lose me, oh, they do, yeah. 
It just sounds like chatter, doesn't it? Like that. Yeah. Um, one of the advantages of machine generate listening to machine generated um, Morse is that it's perfect in its um, it's perfect in its dot and dash length. So there's not any da 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 da. da, da. It's uh, no weighting in it. It sounds very very flat. And in fact, they say if you get on the hand key, you should be working back to make your CW sound like that. And when you get the proper rhythm, it, you know, the proper sort of a bounce, even on a straight key, you, um, you do start, there is a certain amount of rhythm. But straight keys are harder to use because there's more body mass sort of flopping around on the, the arm of that key, the side swipers and things, but I'll get onto that in a moment, which one, you know, you might want to get. And then sending, types of keys, the straight keys, best for a beginner to start with a straight key in my opinion because you get that sort of bouncing effect and this they'll, <coughs> they'll tell you exactly how you should be um, operating the key not not pounding your hand, hand down on it the keys with the flange on the knob in many ways are best because um, no and I'm not going to tell that joke either um, <laughs> but um, they are the best sort of keys I reckon to use um, they're the easiest to use. And the key, the arm of the key should be very solid and the key should have a fairly heavy base so it doesn't start walking around on the, um, the bench that you're working on or the desk. Then <clears throat> there are side swipers or single paddle keys. They're pretty good. I've got some bits and pieces out there in a box that I could show you. Um, so your hand is resting down there. You, you've just got your index finger and your thumb. So they're good for you know, longer periods of sending, because the early telegraphists used to suffer from, um, you don't hear that much about it now, whatever, the, the <coughs> thing that, yeah, typists got where their wrists started to go from, the joints from getting hammered. And then you've got into um, iambic paddles, a bit more difficult to learn, but I recommend using an ir ir iambic paddle as the amount of effort required to send is reduced greatly. Really, the only thing that's moving is your index finger and your thumb and you can set them up so, I've got, because I'm a left-hander, I've got mine set up so that the dots with my left finger and the dashes are with my uh, thumb. But you can switch them around, you can alter the two of them with the internals of your set, if it's a, you know, your transceiver, it's a reasonably modern one, or you can switch it to the other hand. And in fact, there are some little rigs, um, I'm just getting a bit ahead of myself there. Almost all modern HF transceivers are built in Morse keys and they can be programmed to send a 3x3 three three CQ. And that can be handy if you're in a contest because then you, well, I like to send the, the CQ that way and then I've got a separate um, iambic keyer and a little box of electronics so I can adjust the speed immediately like that. With a knob, I can adjust the speed of sending, but... Um, you're better often to send clearly, even at five words per minute, than say 15 if you're making a lot of mistakes and the other person's coming back with PSE, AGN, BK, please again, break. You don't want that, you just want it once, nice and clean, and then to you, you know, GL, good luck, thank you, good luck, dit dit, and then he or you've got someone other else who's keen to work you. Um, next, next steps in the learning process. Uh, CW classes, sitting around a table is a good method as there is a very direct connection between sender and receiver. It's no good if someone's, you know, you sort of disjointed. You want to be very, very direct like that where the person can say, oh, oh I missed that. But, um, I still reckon that is the best way around a table. About 10 minutes or quarter of an hour, then have a break and then say, start with the simple letters and then work your way up from there. But um, I still don't know whether it's best to have it on a screen where as the, the Morse is cut, like with um, um, Just Learn Morse, the, 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 the characters are advancing like that and you can set the speed, the pitch and everything else. So you can just close your eyes and think, oh, I missed that. So you can hit the stop and just look back and you think, yeah, I've got that. 
but you can you can learn it. I mean, it took me a while, but um, and I'm no speedster, but sometimes I'd sit back and I'd think, was that conversation, that contact I had, was that a CW one or a um, or a phone one? Because I didn't, you know, I just wrote a few notes like um, that was a Steve in Adelaide or um, VK3IO. He's another very keen CW operator. <clears throat> then the other one is oh, getting on air, um, EMDRC and their basics of a CW contact website is a very, very good one. I do have a little handout there. Um, use of a, a, a so-called cheat sheet or a prop to the memory sheet is a good idea. I haven't got one here, but I've got one that I hang up. So that say you, you, you're lost for something to, um, to say, you can go da, 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 which is a sort of a, a pause, like the ums and ers in conversation. Um, and then, or you just look at your cheat sheet and it might, you know, you've got another question you want to ask him or, you know, you contest, you know, uh, with a question mark, because the Q code is really, it's brilliantly worked out. It's a statement if there's no question mark and if you put it, you know, like, um, I'm just trying to think of an example. If you don't have a question mark, it's a statement, say. Um, if you do put a question, question mark after it, then the other person will answer the question. So you sort of build up a conversation. And with part of the art, I think, of making it useful and less painful and more enjoyable at the same time, is to not uh, keep your overs very, very short. And instead of going VK5, SFA, this is da da dit dit, uh, VK3, CTM, um, da da da, or da 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 dit, which is when you you're putting it back to a specific person. Just in case someone hears the end of your contact, your exchange of call signs, hears a K instead of a KN and jumps in. KN is just back to you. That's I'm in contact with the station. Don't don't jump in. <clears throat> and then you keep your overs very, very short. It's best to start calling um, CQ at say five words per minute <clears throat> and the station answering should match your speed. He shouldn't come scrambling back to you and he's much more likely to stick with you and have a bit of a talk <clears throat> if you um, keep the overs very short and uh, sort of punchy. You know, they could just might be um, 10 km E, I've even sent that instead of East, Bendigo and uh, BK, and then um, your, call, your call sounds familiar, so worked to you before, question mark, and then the person might come back, yeah, he has, yeah, your RD contest, you do contests, yeah, back he'll come. Yeah, your, um, your call sign looks familiar. Sure enough, then you check and, yep, you worked in before. Uh, there's a legal requirement to send your call sign when commencing transmission, when signing off, and no less frequently than every 10 minutes. It does pay to advertise, but you're really best off to keep them, I think, to a minimum. Uh, just keep your overs very, very short. And there's also a lot of redundancy in language, and you chop that out, if you've, particularly if you've got your little pre-prepared pre um, overs there, um, you won't be sort of lost for words. You just send a little gem of wisdom or whatever and then into the next one. And there are a huge number of uh, common letters, words and abbreviations. And I'm just sort of, how are we going for time there? Because I'll, um, ah, good, yeah. There are huge numbers. There's the Q code, I've mentioned that previously, that are the real building blocks of, um, you know, any conversation. Um, <clears throat> and that's really, that's well worth learning. It's essential really, I think, that you learn that because you can keep things um, uh, a good deal shorter. Some useful abbreviations are again, um, oh, well, the Q codes, you, you, can, you can learn them yourself. We can go over those, say, in lessons. Just learn them, just run through them, keep going through them until you get the most useful ones. But the ones you'll probably use most are, again, please, break, 
That is when you've missed something that the other person sent, and then back they'll come to you again. Or you might just want confirmation of something or other. Um, please, five WPM break. Please, five words per minute, and they will. You might want it faster. And then if you make an error, you just go, dit, 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 like that, the way you go again. And then the other one you'll get that can confuse you is if you find someone other than their rare DX, they seem to be talking to themselves. They seem to be um, transmitting on just one freak, but they're working split. And they won't explain that, but the two, are, he's down here, the target, the, the DX say, you're all, you're all the people who are hunting him. You go up above his frequency, you find a clear spot, you transmit, and he starts hunting up and down through this dog pile, as they call it, looking for people. He might go down that way and then go back up again. So um, if, you, if all of a sudden you start transmitting on his frequency, he'll go up, up, meaning go away, don't transmit on this, keep it clear for the others. Um, and it sounds complicated, but in fact it's very simple and you'll hear a skilled operator and he can work through a great big pile of stations and you don't jump the queue because if you do, you say you're in the log but you won't just to get rid of you and uh, <clears throat> you, you're not in the log at all. Oh, the ums and ers of language while you gather your thoughts, well they're just da di da di da. That's, um, I don't know what it means. Oh, it's sort of, it's just like a pause. Da di da di da. You just tap that out, and that means you're um, you're just thinking, just sort of gathering your thoughts. And the parts of a CW contact it can be broken down into three bits. There's establishing contact, and then there's uh, the body of the contact, and then the signing off. And um, there's the three by what they call the you know when you call CQ CQ CQ. This is VK three Charlie Tango Mike. Yeah, such and such like that. Sometimes I just call CQ, this is VK3, Charlie, Tango, Mike, over. Instead of, you know, the three by three. You can do that, that's, that's quite legitimate. Then there's the body of the contact when you might be, see if it's a contest, it's, it's short and sharp, it's just through like that. There's no, um, no chit chat. You don't, don't want to do that, it's just, um, gee, oh, good luck to you, dit, dit, bang, and he'll have someone other else or you'll have someone else. But they're still fun, you know, to just see how long you can keep it up before your brain goes, <laughs> your brain starts to freeze up, and I've had that happen. Start to hear all sorts of phantom things. Couldn't hear some things, and, but that was after about sort of 24 hours, and when I was a bit younger, I started to, um, and it was signing off, um, that's always, is best to, well, you should really identify yourself when you're signing off because someone other you haven't worked for a long while or, um, <clears throat> might suddenly hear you and he'll come back to you just for a quick contact or someone other else wants points. And at CW goals, you could set yourself uh, to build your receiving and sending speeds up to, say, 15 words per minute. Um, finally, to enter, the, probably the last one would be to enter a WIA contest such as the Remembrance Day contest. The exchanges are very short. Um, for example, it would be say, VK5LJ, this is VK3CTM, VK3CTM, just repeat it. So he's got your, your RST5NN, like that just sounds like did it it da it da it And then the exchange is just how many years you've been on air. You might repeat that and just break, and then in back he'll come to you. The reason I put in that VK5LJ was that he's a, um, he was very keen, I think, to get the points that I could give him because I snuck one in in a high earning point time. It was just before 6 a.m. And <laughs> I can see the clock was ticking down the last minute because he got sort of like triple, double, quadruple or something rather because he was the one he was calling and I got sort of half as much but I just snuck it in and I was watching the clock and bang, we got it in with about 20 seconds to spare. So I thought if they quizzed that one, Alan VK4SN who manages the contest, the software is set so that it, well, I won't go into it, but it, it's, 
it's very, very good. It, it can tell who contact, I don't know how they do it, who contacted who, who gets the big points, who gets half as many, and um, that's, that's the way it is. Um, I'll post uh, links to useful CW websites from time to time. Um, also the links to that, um, the Koch and the uh, Farnsworth methods. Um, <clears throat> what else? Next steps in the process of learning CW. I think we should form groups here on a Sunday afternoon, sitting around a table, say a field trip when we don't have any microphones with us, and um, just, oh, well, you could take them up with you. We could do a double deal on it anyway. Say the spring um, field day, get up on a mountaintop somewhere and work CW, a bit of sideband and um, um, CW, those who want to. And um, that's about the end of things. And uh, any questions? No, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, there's your next in. Yes, Mike. Um, in uh, analog uh, voice transmission, the timbre and the tone of the voice will let you recognise who you're talking to, even if they don't use, use their call sign. Is there something in the, the nature of the way an operator uses CW that you can recognise who it is uh, without his call sign? No, not really. I, 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 I think perhaps if it's a straight key, you might, particularly if you think, Yes, I've heard that more before, and it was um, as bad then as it is now. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, no, if it's um, done by a person who's fairly good and he's got a good steady hand and he's using a straight key, it'll sound almost as if he's using a paddle because um, that's the final objective. But if it's a paddle, no hope. But it, that can be an advantage in some ways because I can remember once making contact with a Turkish station and I could not, for the life of me, think, work out whether it was a male or a, it was a sideband contact, whether it was a male or a female. And I thought, I hope I don't make a mistake here <laughs> and, um, and insult someone greatly. And in the end, that, you know, I somehow worked around the, uh, I didn't say 88, which is, you know, 73, 88, no mistake, like, you know, like love and kisses instead of, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I avoided that. But um, you do, after a while, you, you know where that some of them lurk. There are some people who are on a hell of a lot of the time. I'm not. I do a lot more listening than I do um, uh, getting on air, really. But um, that's it. Oh, you had a question, Des. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, Tony, you have more of well, a question and a statement as well. I'd sort of, I'm, I'm sort of in, fairly keen to join the group as well, that particular CW group. And uh, I'm, just a bit, I'm a big fan of learning by group interaction. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, one, on, you know, one on one or one on many. And uh, I just sort of relate the experience that I had when I first started in, in, uh, my licence, uh, probably 40 years ago. I really struggled with CW. Uh -huh. it was, as people were aware, it was compulsory back then. And um, I, I overcome that by uh, well, a local radio club was running lessons at the Box Hill TAFE. And uh, I reckon about four or five weeks of on, uh, in group lessons there, mm -hmm. uh, I was not only past the five words a minute, but I, I would have been up to about 10 or 12. Uh -huh. uh, but since <coughs> then, it's sort of all faded away. I haven't used it since, but I'm keen to get involved mm -hmm. in it again. I've been using sort of, there's quite a few apps around, but you just need the discipline to do that. Uh, but I think, I'm, well, I'm just making the point that it, it, it really works if it's in a group setting. Mm. I think. Yeah, that instant connection where someone puts up his hand. But um, I reckon that the, probably the best way to learn is at high speed. It's like bike riding, you know, slow bike riding's for experts, isn't it? In fact, there are slow bike riding competitions. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I've, I've been using an app and it's, I've, I've been running it at about 20 words a minute, but uh, it's, it's a discipline to do it. Mm. You need discipline to keep at it. Yeah, I still reckon that you can have words that are coming out, individual letters that are being sent at 25 words a minute with a lot of spacing, like, da, did it, it, did it, 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 and it's far easier, that was the word three, but it's far easier to, um, 
learn it that way and then slowly pack them up. And then finally you'll think, oh, you won't even realise. But you're hearing whole words and you sort of da did it it did did it up, da 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 did it da VK three and so on. And you just do it without even thinking. In, any other questions? No, nah, I think we're done. All, all I would say is that you've sold me so you can pencil me in for the Sunday afternoons. Ah, right then. Uh, yep. Can you hear me, Tony? Yeah. I've got a question. Yes, Tony. Okay, well, when you say you could sit around a table to do it, um, you, you could do it on Zoom, couldn't you? Yeah, you certainly could. With some of the people anyway. Yeah. Oh, good. That would because work pretty well. that's probably how I would find it easier. Uh, and the point you made was that the electronics construction um, leads, let, let's say we were teaching kids to make transmitters. Uh, we can actually make a, a transmitter that would work, it's CW, and um, kids love codes. So every time I, we've had a, a Morse code machine in, in uh, our classes for kids, uh, they've always taken an interest in it. So basically that sounds like two lots of interests in uh, um, catered for. Yeah, I know. I've, I've um, once I was working in a contest and I, you know, I wasn't sort of going really hard at it. And I was up on Mount um, Alexander and several people drifted over, bloody mask, and they were interested in what I was doing and some of them were, they had never seen, oh, what I, what I do is always have my badge on. I have a copy of the call book there. Uh, I've got a cap with <clears throat> another little badge on it. So they can sort of tie me in, you know, it's not as if I'm some mysterious stranger up there doing something that's illegal. And I can show them in the book there. <clears throat> There's the, uh, oh, the, here's a list of uh, all of the amateur radio operators. There's me. And then I say, I'll go down the, uh, um, I think I might have been working sideband, but I had a key there and I showed them the paddle. That intrigued them. But um, I said, look, I'll go down and you'll hear them what they're calling. And I said, see, they're going da 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 CQ, CQ. And they said, what's that mean? Literally, seek you. And then you'll hear the other station come back. And I said, now you can hear him there. He's got, and they were intrigued by this. They're sort of looking like this and they got other people over. So I sort of gave away the contest, well, for a while anyway, went for 24 hours, but just gave it a rest for a bit and I thought, well, I might be able to drum up a bit of support. Because for every one you get, they tell someone other else, I saw this fellow up there and he had a funny looking key and he was going like this and it, when he pressed the button on the paddle on the left, it went dit, 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 dit. When he touched it on the, you know, because I show him that, then it starts, you know, da, 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 and, Da 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 da. So, and that that really gets them in. And uh, anyone would know a Morse key, a straight Morse key, would be like a say a, a kilt or a bagpipes. If you asked anyone what's that, they'd know, wouldn't they? Oh, that's a Morse key. A lot of younger people wouldn't, but you know. Any more questions? Uh, and, to and Tony, um, FL Digi, which we played with you, you and I has got the Farnsworth method built in. So you can send blocks of text uh, spaced as the Farnsworth method. Oh, did you, yeah. FL did you, yes. We've been and you using can check it in the digital, digital modes group. It's a decoder mm. as well as an encoder. Yeah, sometimes it comes out crazy if you're sending, it's not that good. But um, yeah, yeah, we, we, you yeah. definitely need a good uh, input to it. But uh, mm. the teaching aspect of it is really, really good because you you can look back on the screen to see what it's been sending. Real advantage. We can just close your eyes, and uh, that's the best way. I can just to listen to it, not watch it. Um, yeah, not, not watch it coming out on the screen. That, that, well, I, I did enjoy <laughs> your. Um, being a member of your group before, when you were talking to another Castlemaine station. So uh, I'll be wanting to join your group. 
remember having a 10 metre CW contact with you when I was on the summit of, uh, um, what's it, one south of Alexander, that 1,000 metre peak. Whatever. Mount Macedon. Yeah. I was up there with you, Cole, I think. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I was up there with Cole. But um, that we should do a few trips out like that, I think. Another one would be back to the gym, gym. Um, Cole and I and Graham went up there. Um, we could just do a CW one, or we'll, we could work phone and CW. But um, CW does work in well with climbing up onto peaks because you've got very, very light gear. And if you go through SOTA, and I haven't been very active on that of late, you will see that some of the more adventurous climbers like these um, Swiss, when they're getting up on ice-covered peaks, are frequently using um, very small gear and um, they're working it. I think, I think we've run out of questions and probably run out of time anyway. No more? We've always got time. Fair enough. Thank you. Thanks very much. Cheers. If I could just uh, say thank you to Tony CTM, uh, to Tony um, KKP, and uh, for everyone who's assisted putting this uh, session together tonight. I think that uh, we'll leave here with a, a better understanding of what SIGS is, and uh, I look forward to um, coordinating any of the SIGS inquiries as per that flowchart that I've handed out. Uh, anyone who's on Zoom, um, or uh, and wants a copy of that uh, flowchart, just contact me at the secretary at the club and I'll shoot it out to you. Neil, any closing comments? No. Oh, look, I just want to extend my thanks to all the presenters this evening and um, uh, thanks to those who uh, joined us on Zoom. Um, I think we've just about wrapped up for the evening, haven't we? That, that's about it. I think we've got warm pies waiting for us and uh, some of us might want to get away a bit early tonight. It's pouring rain outside. You probably can't hear it on Zoom, but we can definitely hear it in here. Um, so thank you very much for joining us and uh, we look forward to seeing you all again soon. <laughs>